What's up Choco Bros? Today I'm doing what might be the first video in a new series where I go over my top 10 favorite moments from each Final Fantasy game and with the brand new Pixel Remaster having recently introduced Final Fantasy VI to a new generation of players I thought it would be the perfect game to start things off with. So without further ado, here are my top 10 favorite moments from Final Fantasy VI. Needless to say, there will be spoilers. Number 10. The Opera Scene Often lauded as the most iconic scene in the game, the mere existence of the opera scene is remarkable. That they would attempt something so grandiose within the limited hardware of the Super Nintendo and yet somehow pull it off is an achievement in of itself. But it's not just the excellent presentation of the scene that makes it such a joy to watch. It's also a memorable sequence within the larger context of the overall narrative, where our heroes devise a crafty scheme to fool Setzer and recruit him and his airship to their cause. But their plan is of course hijacked by none other than Ultros, and the resulting pandemonium is glorious to behold. We not only get a boss fight against a giant octopus on an opera stage, but also various sweet character moments like seeing another side of the formerly ice-cold Celis, or watching Locke work his way into the play with notably lousy acting skills, culminating, of course, in Setzer's grand entrance. But as fun as the events on stage are, I personally enjoy the aftermath of the scene even more, with Celis cleverly tricking Setzer into joining the party, and him actually being a good sport about it, and, like a true gambler, betting his life on our cause as if it were a poker chip. Which is just too cool. Number 9. Locke and Rachel's final goodbye. We get many powerful conclusions to individual character arcs in the world of Ruin, and Locke's is definitely one of the most touching. The game slowly reveals to us that his fervent desire to protect the women he comes across is in part a coping mechanism for the guilt that he's carried since the death of Rachel, the woman he loved but was unable to save. Despite his growing feelings for Celis, Locke is unable to move on with his life, being bound by the grief and guilt that the memory of Rachel still causes him. This all comes to a head when he uses the Phoenix Magicide to try and undo Rachel's very death. But the Magicide's power is limited and it only manages to bring back Rachel for a brief moment, which nonetheless allows her to convey to Locke that she did not die in resentment of him, but rather in gratitude and in happiness for the time they shared together. And these very words save Locke and free him from the chains of guilt and grief binding his heart, so that he's finally able to accept the loss, move on with his life and devote himself to everything he still has that's worth loving and protecting. It's a beautiful scene, made all the more so by the striking image of the incandescent phoenix and the stirring theme that accompanies it, suitably called Forever Rachel. Number 8. Gao meets his father. This is one of those amazing scenes that was even more amazing due to how surprising and unexpected it was. Cause let's face it, other than the completely optional characters, Gao was by far the least relevant member of the party, having virtually no connection to the main plot of bringing down the Empire and defeating Kefka. He seemed to be in the game mostly for gameplay reasons, to add another unique playstyle to our party, and his few appearances in the story were just a small handful of minor scenes that were invariably comedic in tone. And yet, his wistful theme song seemed to hint that there might be a more serious and bittersweet aspect to his character. Which brings us to the scene in the world of Ruin where he meets his father, which starts out with some really fun and light-hearted interactions between our whole party, but soon becomes, frankly astonishing in the profound and unforeseen emotional punch that it packs. Because, as it turns out, Gao's father is a mentally broken old man who went mad with grief when his wife died during childbirth, after which, seeing the newborn baby as a horrifying demon child, he carried him into the wild and abandoned him there. He himself relates this to the party as if it had been a mere nightmare of his, denying its reality and being utterly oblivious to the fact that the child he abandoned is standing right there in front of him. Sabin, who had pushed the hardest for this family reunion to happen, can't bear to see the old man say such horrible things about Gao and is just about ready to beat some sense into him when he is stopped by Gao himself. For even after all that, Gao bears no resentment or ill will towards his father and instead finds solace in the mere knowing that he still lives. And just like that, with a single scene, a character that had up until that point 
been easy to overlook, becomes a deeply sympathetic figure. Such is the magic of Final Fantasy VI. Number 7. Edgar and Sabin return to Figaro Castle. This scene is a perfect example of how to seamlessly integrate a flashback within the present story in a way that feels organic and relevant. It's Sabin's first time in Figaro Castle since he left 10 years before, so naturally he begins to reminisce, particularly on the events that caused his departure. It's a very moving flashback, especially the moment where a young Sabin, in tears due to his father's death, lashes out at those in the castle that only seem concerned with the matter of succession to the throne without actually expressing any genuine sadness for the loss of the man that just perished. As a result, Sabin's long-standing aversion and alienation towards life in the royal court reaches its apex and, wanting out of the insensitive politicking and constant wars that will inevitably continue to be a part of the brothers' lives as long as they remain in the political sphere of Figaro, he suggests to Edgar that they should leave the country altogether so that they can live their lives freely. But Edgar reminds him that the country would be lost if the two heirs left and thus suggests a coin toss to decide their fates. Whoever wins earns a life of freedom, while the other will have to bear the heavy burden of the crown. It's a very poignant moment, and arguably becomes even more so later on, when we find out that Edgar deliberately used a two-headed coin so that he would be the one saddled with the burden of kingship, and his brother would be free to pursue his own path. This flashback alone is amazing, but what follows is icing on the cake. The scene seamlessly transitions back into the present and as Edgar joins Sabin in the throne room, the music stops and we get a pleasantly quiet moment between the two brothers, reunited at last in their home. As they look back on the day that they went their separate ways, they note how they've changed and grown in their years apart and after exchanging playful words of sibling affection and support, they share a drink, now that they're adults, and toast to their late parents and their country. Perfection. Number 6. Kafka kills General Leo. Of all of Kafka's heinous deeds, and there are certainly many, this might be the most emotionally devastating one because it comes right after a moment in which everything seemed to be headed towards a peaceful resolution, with the honorable General Leo managing, with Terra's help, to convince the espers to trust humans, thus creating a path for the two races to come together in cooperation rather than strife. It's always crushing when a moment of great hope is shattered and replaced by a dreadful reality, and that is precisely what Kefka does here, betraying the trust of the espers which Leo had worked so hard to attain and reducing them all to magicide, in order to continue to exploit them as a resource for further warfare. Leo was, of course, ill-suited to the Empire, being a fundamentally decent man who had displayed integrity and compassion on several occasions, and thus he is naturally appalled by this turn of events and quick to turn his sword on Kefka. But that only serves to intensify the tragedy of this moment as Kefka deceives and murders Leo in cold blood, and with him goes the last hope that the tyrannical Empire could change its ways. It's an intense and powerful scene and a vivid example of Kafka's brilliance as a villain. It ultimately concludes with Leo's funeral, which was a suitably touching send-off to his admirable and tragic character, the man who was meant to redeem the evil empire, but instead became another one of its victims. Number 5. The Ending From what I've seen, Final Fantasy VI ending doesn't seem to be especially popular when people rank the endings of the various Final Fantasy games, but, as its placement on this list suggests, I find it rather underrated and think there's a lot to love in it. For starters, I enjoy the format and presentation of every party member getting a little sequence to themselves, which is fitting for a game with such a massive cast of characters. However, much like with the game as a whole I would say, the ending is mainly centered around Terra, and it's here that her journey truly comes full circle. The Espers are fading from the world, which puts Terra's fate in question as she is half Esper herself. But then, on her way out of Kafka's tower, she exchanges some parting words with her father Maduin, who hints that she may be able to remain in this world if there is something in it that she strongly cherishes. After every character has had their moment, Terra takes center stage and uses what remains of her Esper powers to boost the airship's flight and allow everyone to escape from the crumbling tower, which really shows how far she's come. 
In the beginning of the game, she was easily overcome with fear and constantly relied on the protection of others, but now she herself is taking the initiative and protecting everyone else. But as thrilling as this sequence is, my favorite part of the ending is actually what comes after, when the credits begin to roll, and the party, now safe and sound, flies over the world that they just saved. A world which is now beginning to mend from the ruin Kefka had inflicted upon it, with the rebuilding of homes, the planting of new seeds of hope, and the birth of new lives. And yet, the very last thing we're shown in the ending still manages to trump everything that came before it as far as I'm concerned. Terra, standing at the front edge of the Falcon, unties her hair and lets it flow freely with the wind. It's a beautiful image that, in my view, symbolizes how she has attained true freedom at last. Remember, at the start of the game, her life up until that point had been one of slavery and servitude, where she had been robbed even of her own conscious will. But here, at the end, she has finally managed to rise above those that had sought to subjugate and enslave her, and is now the master of her own destiny, free to follow her own heart, with a strong will tempered by a motherly love for all of the world's children. And you couldn't ask for a better conclusion to the central character arc of this wonderful story. Number 4. Kyan's Letters to Lola Yes, that's how I pronounce his name with a hard C because that's closer to the way it's written in the original Japanese, but you're free to say Cyan if you want, that's totally fine too. Anyway, Kyan is a unique character in Final Fantasy VI cast, I feel, because unlike the other party members whose tragic backstory we see through the use of flashbacks, Kyan's misfortune and suffering begins in the present and we see it unfold and compound in real time. His kingdom is overthrown, his people are massacred, and he must even endure the pain of seeing his own wife and child depart on the Phantom Train. And of course, after being unable to protect Doma from the Empire and Kefka, he also fails to prevent them from bringing the world itself to ruin. And as a samurai whose life is devoted to serving and protecting others, all of these failures to do so become a crushingly heavy burden to bear. And thus, by the time the second half of the game begins, Kayan is a broken man, chained to the past and unable to move on with his life. In his travels, he comes across a woman named Lola, who has also lost her beloved and continues to write letters to him, clinging to the false hope that he may yet be alive. Unable to bear seeing her in such sorrow, Kayan tries to console her by writing letters to her as if he were the man she had lost. But he soon realizes that he is only preventing her from accepting the truth of her loss and thus keeping her stuck to the past and unable to move on with her life. And of course, he also realizes that he himself is in the situation, and that his seemingly compassionate gesture was also a means for him to escape from the reality of his own loss and pain. It's a really poignant situation, and it is presented to us in a beautiful way, as we first find his letters, and then the man himself, standing on the edge of a cliff, overlooking the world of ruin below, as he composes a wistful haiku about the world that was, and what remains of it. Thankfully, he then finds the resolve to begin to move forward and, in spite of his past failures, to continue to fight for a better world and future, rather than remaining stuck in the past. And if we return to Lola's house, he even encourages her to do the same. Overall, it's just a really moving sequence, centered around a mature character with a great story to tell. Number 3. Setsa remembers Daryl. Out of all the characters' backstories in Final Fantasy VI, Setzers might just be my favorite. There's just something irresistibly romantic about a pair of flirtatious airship pilots flying through the skies in playful competition at the end of which they meet atop a hill to watch the sunset together. But it's not just the quality of the backstory itself, but also the way it is framed and presented, with Setzer reminiscing on his time with Daryl and recounting it to the party as they descend Daryl's tomb in search of a new pair of wings that will allow them to fly again and renew their hopes of restoring the world. This is literally the only scene she appears in, but Daryl always leaves a strong impression on me as a really interesting and colorful character. I love the way she teases Setzer after beating him in a race, saying, How long do you plan on hanging back there? Aren't you gonna try to pass me? Or are you too entranced by my lovey behind? These little moments and touches, as brief as they are, are enough to get a feel for the kind of relationship they had, and thus feel Setzer's pain when we see him, forlorn and alone, atop the hill where he and Daryl had always met at the end of the day. 
For Daryl, in her indomitable ambition to fly higher than anyone ever had, tragically falls and dies in a crash, and thus the two lovebirds would never soar the skies together again. The whole scene is also impeccably accompanied and enhanced by two stellar pieces of music. The first one is Epitaph, which is only heard here during Setzer's melancholic reminiscences, but then the music stops and as Setzer finds the will to pursue his dreams again and reveals the falcon to the party, the iconic Searching for Friends plays for the first time, signaling the beginning of a new journey and a new hope. Number 2. Kyan overcomes his grief. Even if his character arc had ended with the previous scene of his letter to Lola, Kyan would still have had one of the best stories in the game. But, unlike some other characters that were a little neglected in the world of Ruin, Kyan actually got two quests to himself, with the second one being even more powerful than the first. For despite his attempts to move forward after the episode with Lola, Kyan was still in despair as he continued to blame himself for his inability to protect his kingdom, the world itself, and even his own family. And this makes him an easy target for the malevolent entity called Rexol, which feeds on the sorrow and destructive feelings of anguished souls. This setup allows for a marvelous sequence where we traverse the mindscape of Kyan's soul in an attempt to free him from the guilt and grief eating away at his heart. During this sequence, we see fragments of the touching memories of his time with his wife and child, which, accompanied by his stirring theme song playing in the background, make for an amazing build-up to the fight against Rexol. And then, after the party defeats this entity that was preying on Kyan's feelings of powerlessness and self-reproach, his wife and child appear before him one last time, begging him to stop blaming himself for their deaths and letting him know they'll always be with him. And thus, through the love of his family, Kyan is finally able to overcome his grief and leave the painful past behind. His wife and child live on in his heart, but he now looks ahead, and instead of lamenting the things he couldn't do, he sets his eyes on the good that he can still do for the world, and that's a beautiful conclusion to a beautiful story. Number 1. Terror regains the will to fight. As I alluded to earlier, Terra essentially grew up as a brainwashed slave to be used as a tool of warfare, and thus it's understandable that she feels lost at the start of the game. She's unsure about her own identity and what she should do with her life, and questions even her ability to feel love. And while she makes some steps towards self-actualization in the world of balance, such as discovering and coming to terms with her origins as a child of a human and an esper, it's in the world of Ruin that her character really comes into her own. When we find Terra again in this post-apocalyptic world, she's taking care of a group of orphan children in the village of Mobleys. She's become a nurturing surrogate mother and claims to have lost her will to fight as a result. Celis and the rest respect her wish not to fight anymore and leave her be. But when they return later on, the village is once again attacked by the ancient monster Humbaba and Terra begs her friends to protect the place, claiming that she no longer has the strength to do so. However, when the party struggles to defeat Humbaba and the village and its children are in mortal peril, something awakens in Terra and she shifts into trance once more and defeats the monster with her esper powers. What follows is an absolutely magical moment with a cinematic quality to it that should not be possible with 16-bit sprites and pixel art, and yet it is. Terra, relieved that she's managed to save her children from danger, approaches them, but because she's in her Esper form, the children run away in fear, screaming, it's another monster. But then, a little girl takes a step forward and asks, Mama, it's you, isn't it? I can tell. With that, the remaining children realize that this seemingly frightening creature is none other than their dear mother and run to her side once more. And it is in this moment, surrounded by her beloved children, that Terra finally realizes that not only had she already found the love that she had sought and wondered if she was able to feel, but also that this love and the will to fight can coexist and that the desire and determination to protect those she loves can give her the strength to do so, and thus she vows to fight once more, in order to make the world a safer place for her children as well as for all those yet unborn. 
This is character development at its finest. And the answer Terra arrives at in her quest for love is as heartwarming as it is an immensely pleasant surprise. Because when she first started talking about wanting to know what love is at the beginning of the game, I absolutely did not expect that she would discover it from maternal love rather than the usual romantic love that most stories tend to lean on. It's rather mind-blowing actually that Square gave us such a stellar female hero's journey back in 1994. With a protagonist that starts out as an insecure and lost little girl, but ultimately becomes a strong and resolute mother figure who fights to protect her children with everything she's got. Truly a moment that epitomizes Final Fantasy VI timeless quality. Well, there you have it. Those were my top 10 favorite moments from Final Fantasy VI. How'd you like my picks? Of course, it's highly unlikely that my list will be a perfect match with yours, so if there's any moments that I failed to mention that would make your list of favorites, let me know down in the comments. And let me know if you'd like to see me do a similar list for other Final Fantasy games, as I rather enjoy ranking stuff. Anyway, thanks for watching until the end, I really appreciate it. And as usual, if you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet, and click the bell icon so that you don't miss future top lists and other Final Fantasy related content. Alright, see you around Chocobros.